Welcome to the Disruptive Innovation Festival, the online festival of ideas that asks the question, what if we can redesign everything? My name is Kinge and I'll be your div host for today. And in this session, we're going to talk all about material science, modularity, and how we can outsmart the complex manufacturing of everyday products with it. We're joined today by Mark Miodovnik, who is director of the Institute of Making at the University College of London. We are also joined by Erik Lochtens, who is Corporate Director Circular Economy at ECOR, and Lucas Hooks, who works at uh, DSM Niaga. Please remember this is an interactive session. We want you to ask questions, post comments, and you can do that in the discussion box below this video or tweet using the hashtag ThinkDiff. That's it for me for now, uh, and I want to give it over to Mark. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, everyone. Hello, with all, hello, the globe. <laughs> this is so exciting. <laughs> Love this. This is the future. Um, okay, so I want to talk to you. I want to introduce this topic by just giving you a brief history of materials. Um, this is uh, obviously um, going to be quite a whistle stop tour, but of course, we may, everything is made of something. Right, so all of the stuff around us, the stuff that I'm wearing, all of the stuff in this office, all made of stuff. And in the beginning, the stuff that we made was, I mean, relatively now, from an art perspective, now simple. Like we made metals. Okay, there's a metal fork, and it's a, it's a, it's a piece of metal. Now it's not easy to make a piece of metal. It, most of us, if we were just sent out into the world and told smelt some rocks, we'd find it hard to make metal. But anyway, we managed it as a civilization, right? And we made other materials too. We made ceramics. Here's some ceramic. Again, very amazing, wonderful stuff. And we can make things that are transparent. Glass. This, without this, the world becomes a difficult place to live because there are no windows and the wind comes in the rain, especially in Britain. It's not something you want to be doing. And so we got the hang of stuff. And then as we got the hang of stuff, what we started to do is, is have more ambitions to make different things. And that's when we started to, to, to to bond stuff together. So this is an example of a fountain pen. It's sort of the, the style of fountain pen that was invented at the end of the 19th century. And it has many different materials. It does things. It's a, it's a lid that's metal. And there's actually, this is where polymers and plastics come in. So they're nice that you can shape them very easily and make ergonomic shapes uh, quite, quite cheaply. And then if you open it up, you find there's a metal cartridge and some ink in there. And this was actually, I know it's hard to believe now, but a revolution. This was the mobile phone of its age. So you could walk around and you could, you could write in ink without having to have an inkwell. And then, of course, fast forward a bit longer, and now we have sort of modern pens, and they're plastic and, and metal all combined, and lots of different plastics in there, and lots of different mechanisms. And it's cheap. Now, it's suddenly anyone can have this. It's almost so cheap you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and things like a lighter, you know, you want fire. In the old days, it took you a long time, and now we have a lighter, no problem at all. But again, it's, it's lots of different materials. So what you see is an increase of complexity as we've kind of uh, grown as a civilization. Um, so you might be watching this on a, using a webcam, and wow, you know, that's a material. <laughs> it's a complex material with lots of different types of component in it. It's got transparent bits, and it's got metal bits, and it's got plastic bits, and it's got bits at the end for connectivity. Now, in the end, the kind of the epitome of the complexity of modern life today and modern materials is a mobile phone. This is a, a one that no longer works anymore, but you know, it's got it's got a touch screen and a liquid crystal display, and inside it's got all sorts of electronics and a lithium battery. And actually, this has more than half of the periodic table in it. So of all the elements we know exist, it has half of them, more than half of them in it. But what we haven't done as a civilization, as, as material scientists and engineers, designers, makers, is, is make this recyclable. So when this, at the end, ends its days, we don't, re we don't get back all the complexity. We don't recover all of those materials again. And this is contributing very, very alarmingly to waste in the world, to global warming because of loss of energy that is used in making this sort of stuff and resources of the world. It's pollution, and we see this in the oceans in terms of plastic pollution and other pollutions. 
And so finally, before I hand over to Lucas to talk us more about maybe how we solve these problems, I'll just tee up a very simple problem, which is not a mobile phone, right? Here is just a piece of plywood. And what is plywood? It's a very good form of wood in which we chop it up and bond it together with glue and adhesives. And this allows us to make all sorts of furniture and architecture. And it's, it's a lovely material. It's got so many uses. But at the end of its life, it's not recyclable. We can't do anything with it. So is this the future? Are we just going to keep making more and more complex things and then have this enormous heap of waste and pollution at the end? Well, I hope not. And in fact, I think this is one of the biggest problems facing us as a civilization. And I'll hand over to Lucas at that point to tell us what he's been doing. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the, this, uh, this, this great introduction of complexity. It's, uh, it's been an, an issue where we have been thinking um, about with, with our colleagues at DSM Niaga um, a lot, because we are, we are a small company, a startup um, linked to the material science company, DSM. And what we do is we redesign everyday stuff. So um, typically the stuff that is very wasteful or has uh, toxic ingredients in it. And we redesign the whole manufacturing process and the whole material composition to make it as simple as possible. Um, only with known materials, materials known on its uh, recycle potential, known on its health impact. Um, and um, if we use more than one material, we should uh, be able to recover the two materials in a pure form. Um, and um, the company started because two entrepreneurs came today, DSM, and they were, they were driven by the frustration of wasting carpets, right? They have been uh, working in the carpet industry and they've seen the, the, the immense amounts of waste and they first wanted to redesign it from a pure bio-based uh, uh, materials. They thought that is, that is part of the solution. And then in the end, after a couple of years, they succeeded. Um, however, that was not recyclable um, and uh, they didn't solve really the problem of, of, of waste there. Um, although it, it, it probably is a marketable product, they decided to um, start over again um, and make a product that is fully recyclable uh, rather than only bio-based. And then they figured this out for, I think, most of it except for the adhesive. Um, and the adhesive is... Um, it is one of the, 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 the competences of DSM, a material science company based here in the Netherlands. Um, and they, they asked a very simple question. Can you guys make an adhesive that is reversible, that you can unclick on demand in order to harvest two different materials in a pure form? Um, DSM liked that question and uh, started working. And after a couple of months, they, they came with a an, an polyester adhesive. Um, polyester, why polyester? Because one of the two layers of this carpet was already polyester. So in that way, um, this wouldn't uh, over complex the, the amount of materials in the carpet. Um, and the polyester adhesive was a special one because it, it bonds the two layers together, like any other adhesive or glue. But if you give it a signal, a frequency signal after use, it decouples in a split second. So we have been able with this adhesive to um, laminate different layers together and uh, in, in carpet it's all textiles, right? So we, we laminate those together. Um, for example, wool and the polyester backing or a polyamide and nylon and the polyester backing. And then after its, its useful life, we, we apply it to a signal and you have two uh, separate streams of, of materials for recycling. Um, this is of course um, was, was kind of disruptive for the carpet industry. So we had to uh, redesign the whole manufacturing process. And we are now at a stage where um, we can manufacture uh, all carpets that you, that you know, all designs that you know, but then in, 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 in either made from one material or from two materials and then with the reversible adhesive to it. So you can harvest both. Um, now it's in the market. The carpet is in the market in the US and, and hopefully it will come soon in Europe. We um, didn't stop with carpets, of course, because we, we discovered that it's not only the recycling that, um, that we made possible, but also the health impact of the carpet. There are no VOCs anymore, no, no off-gassing anymore. Um, and it's easier to clean, it was easier to install. So a lot of other 
benefits that came to this new product that was so simple in its material composition that we actually didn't see coming. Um, and that, that made us very enthusiastic about redesigning other stuff than only carpet. Um, so we announced uh, this week that we will collaborate with a mattress firm, uh, Alping, uh, based in the Netherlands, and um, redesign the whole product of mattress together with them in order to make it from the simplest material set possible, um, only healthy materials and reversible uh, connections. So all materials can be harvested again after the mattress life. And we recycled back into a mattress like with carpet, it's carpet to carpet recyclable. Um, but this is only, um, this was the first on the list next to carpet, but there, there's of course huge potential for this glue to redesign other stuff uh, than only mattresses and carpet. Um, and both mattresses and carpet are, are textiles, so we are now very used to work with textiles, um, but there's more than only, only textiles in the world. So we, we were looking for um, someone who, who can make, or a company that can make um, for example, hardboard panels in a way that it is also uh, a pure material set, no additives. Um, so we can apply different things to it with our adhesive and it can be, can be uh, all materials can be harvested back after its useful life. And then at the Al Macarta Foundation, the CN100, we met with ECOR um, and I met with Eric and um, I explained that I was uh, going to work at Niaga and uh, that we had this reversible adhesive. Um, and uh, he kept on calling me after that meeting because he was very interested in the adhesive. And, uh, and, and now, I think it's almost a year later, uh, we, have been, we have been doing a lot of uh, testing and trials and, uh, and the results look amazing. Um, and um, maybe it's best to give the words to Eric now and to explain a little bit about the eCore material. And then uh, together we can brainstorm on how the eco material and, uh, and and maybe also textiles and the adhesive can um, redesign maybe everything around us. Eric, to you. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's actually exactly a year ago that we met uh, via the EMF, and uh, also to introduce you then first, what is the technology eco? Uh, basically, our company uh, took about a decade to develop. Uh, the technology where with only water, pressure, and heat, we can take almost any kind of cellulose fibers. And cellulose fibers are around us every day, everywhere. You might think of uh, Lucas' shirt you are seeing. Um, you might think of um, uh, materials like uh, spam brewer's grain, uh, coconut husk, um, uh, corn husk, um, coffee grounds. They're everywhere. And basically what we can do is that when we press it into a panel, then we need to find uh, applications for this because the panel on itself, of course, is nothing. So we are doing a lot of projects where we initiate and catalyze. And one of them was a project with a, a, a global leading brewing company. And we were working on products where uh, it was about the proof of concept and to get them into an adhesive. And to give you an idea, I've got a sample here. This is um, ECOR made from old office paper where we laminate each other and you get a structural panel. But you also have shapes and forms where, you could, where the shapes and forms will bring different applications. And our challenge is always, how do you keep the materi materials integrity? How do we make sure that when we get the product back, that we can keep these fibers, we can put it back in the grinder and make a new panel out of it, where ultimately we eliminate the concept of a life cycle, but we can start talking only user cycles. And in this proof of concept phase uh, with this company, we uh, took it as a pilot project to use the reversible adhesive Niaga in order to get to and uh, product assembly and we were flabbergasted by the results and most of important from our side from eco side is the easiness of which it was happened so um yeah that's where also uh lucas team came up with glue like a screw we are seeking and finding um uh, uh, applications where we now can make products out of these panels 
with using the Niaga technology, which can be an endless si product cycles again, because we can separate them and bring them back to the natural resources, upcycle them continuously. So I think that's um, uh, the basic and the essence of uh, what we're doing. Um, can I, can I, oh, hold on. Yes. Trying to unmute myself. Sorry, can I, can I ask something? Um, um, where do you, I mean, how far can this go, do you think? Like, it sounds, it's a great technology. Um, what, 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 what? You know, how far can you push that in terms of kind of the mechanical properties of these boards, and 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 where do you which products do you see them replacing? Well, um, what I'm looking specifically at is what is in all our offices around us. Uh, so you th uh, think tabletops, think the flooring, uh, think uh, um, cabinetry. We laminate these stuff together exactly as what you saw. Uh, so I've got a laminate here. There is an eager inside, but how can I do this? But a traditional tabletop is basically up for incineration of landfill at the end of its user cycle, so it's gone. And only in the UK, they manufacture more than 100 million, 1 million tons of MDF per year, which will be laminated or glued together, which is inseparable anymore. When we now could take the melamine or the veneer, use the adversable heat adhesive, and on an eco panel, then basically at the end of its life cycle use, you can separate the two of them again. We can put them back in the grinder, make a new panel out of it. The adhesive can be renewed. So you eliminate all these, uh, uh, all these wastes and all these materials. I think that's where the real uh, possibilities lie. Of course, to be validated and of course to be checked because we are in the beginning of this route. But that's where I see a tremendous potential. When I talk to the um, manufacturers of uh, things like plastic bottles, um, which is already a material cycle that is very well known in terms of its recyclability, like PET and high, um, HTPE, the high density polyethylene, they, they say that there is a kind of degradation of properties after a certain number of cycles. Is that something you find with yours, or have you not got there yet? Or, um, I mean, is there an is there an issue of having to bring in new material after a certain number of recycling cycles? Question for me or for Lucas, Mark? Either. <laughs> um, I, what I can say about Eker is that, yes, we can mix in the same waste stream. Uh, so, for example, when you take uh, miscanthus, uh, elephant grass, we can mix it in. Um, but normally what we look at is, for example, the paper industry when you recycle a, pay, uh, a cellulose fiber for paper and corrugated carbon or whatsoever, it's got, it's got, a, it's got a maximum of seven till uh, eight times of recycling. Uh, we haven't found the number of times yet. So we can take very short fibers. So even the what they call the inking sludge, so that's uh, cellulose fibers from the inking office paper, those are very short fibers. We are still uh, capable of making panels out of that. Huh. And Mark, to your question from a Niaga perspective, um, we are working especially with polyester because that works very well in terms of, of, of looping the material like glass. It doesn't really lose its quality. What we uh, do see coming as a challenge is the color because typically carpets come with color. Um, and, uh, and the colorants are not designed to be decoupled um, like, like this adhesive. So um, what we are now really looking for is a way to, to color different textiles or to, to color fibers in a way that it can be decolored very easily afterwards. And that is uh, definitely a challenge going forward um, because um, the colors are for us now the biggest challenge to keep the materials at a, at a high value in the loop. Because it's not it's not the material polyester per se that is uh, that is the challenge. You, you see it sometimes in bottles because, for example, PPC adhesives are used for the label on it, and then definitely the quality uh, goes down because the PPC, of course, contaminates um, the polyester. 
All right, we have some questions coming in from the audience, so I would like to jump in uh, and, and start asking uh, one. For everybody watching, we'd really like you to post questions, so, so keep on doing that. Uh, you can post them in the discussion box below this video. Um, so the question comes in uh, from Elisa, and it, it's a question for Lucas. Uh, how do you choose what you are going to redesign? Do you have some products have a bigger potential than others? Great, great question. Um, yeah, we, we do have a, a, a preference now for products that are kind of bulky and, and that are uh, around us a lot. And that, that is why carpet and mattresses are the first two products because they, I think together with diapers, they are in most countries, they're on the, the top five of landfill items. Um, they are big, we use them a lot and they contain also a lot of material. So they are, on the one hand, a huge problem in the, in the, in the waste uh, volumes. On the other hand, there are huge potential if you can uh, harvest these materials again. Um, and that is different with, um, with packaging. Packaging is uh, a lot altogether, but it's difficult to, um, to, um, uh, to collect the different package packaging items and then separate um, very thin layers of, um, uh, of materials. That is not to say that in packaging, this problem of complexity is not present. It is definitely present and it's also definitely part of our, uh, of our scope to decomplex um, the world of packaging because multi-layer packaging, of course, is, is one of the examples of a, a huge variety of complexity that, that reduces the potential of recycling. But for us now also to make the economic benefit, uh, uh, business case, um, bigger bulky stuff, that is, that is really what, what interests us. And that's also where, where Ecor, of course, plays with the tabletops. Um, this is a lot of material. And if we can harvest this again, bring it back to the economy, we will all benefit, that's for sure. And um, yeah, so you, you quickly manage uh, a mention about uh, bulky uh, being preferable also because of the, the business case around it. Can you elaborate a bit on that and how it, 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 it takes like part of your decisions that you make? Um, on the business case, you mean, or on the, the selection? Well, I think in this case, on the, on the business case, yeah. Okay. Um, carpet was, I think, the first because, um, like I said, it has a lot of material in it, but it also has, um, uh, today, it has a huge diversity of materials. So today, the business case for recycling uh, carpet is, is pretty tough. Um, because you have to separate those different materials. They're glued together typically with latex, and that is, that is tough. Um, if, we, if we are able to redesign it from only two materials, or preferably only one material, and then you don't even need the adhesive, then um, we can bring the polyester, for example, if polyester is the material of choice, we can bring it back like with bottles. And... Um, making a, a new polyester, virgin quality polyester from an, a good stream of waste polyester, it takes only a, a very limited amount of energy uh, compared to making polyester from crude oil, for example. Um, and that is, um, that really helps in the business case because then we can loop the materials, bring it back into carpets and everyone that has worked on it can um, earn their money back and can, can earn their investment back without an, um, a subsidy from the government or without uh, special recycling programs. And that's, of course, where we, in the end, have to work towards to, that it's not um, um, only a program from, from a government or, uh, or a recycling effort, that is really part of the economy and that it makes economic sense for everyone to do so. And, and I think we discovered that with a simple material set, this is so much closer to reality than with a complex material set. Mark or Eric, do you have any uh, any um, any stories on that? Sorry. Well, <clears throat> um, yeah, basically, um, what happens is that uh, also the need for mat uh, for materials in the in the furniture, or interior decoration uh, industry, and so on, is that we are exchanging materials more and more and over again. Where on the other side, you see the scarcity of the raw material is increasing over and over again. Where, uh, 
uh, at the triple uh, at the third value is that the industry has take has to take about 10 percent of its annual turnover to get rid of the waste they create themselves so it's a finite business model in essence eh? because there is a lot of cost attached to keep on manufacturing and basically with a technology like us you eliminate the concept that you have to purchase your raw materials over and over again so in a technology like us it could very well be that in the first cycle we are from a square meter price or a tons price we are uh, a little bit more expensive than the uh, material we're going to uh, replace but when you can take it into the second cycle the third cycle and you can give it different shapes forms and uh, product applications that's where the real margin and the real margin explosion will create plus you don't have to pay for getting uh, uh, getting rid of the waste you create yourself because you manufacture um, a certain size say uh, three meters by one meter and then the fabricator needs only 2.80 and he needs 90 centimeters the rest you're throwing away even before it's first use we can take this material put it back in the grinder make and it becomes raw material for the next panel again and I think from an economical uh, value perspective that's where a lot of money is being made it's, it's going to be made all right, so uh, let's continue to another question. It comes in from uh, Pim, and he asks, in the Igor case, will the Niagara glue be fully separated before recycling, or will the glue be considered waste? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think this is a question for uh, the, both of us, Niagara and Igor. Uh, we have to value, uh, validate that. But the first impressions and the first test is that we can really recycle uh, the ECOR. And um, we, do, we do not want to have the glue to be considered waste. It can be reused. It's reversible adhesive. But that still has to be validated. And from a Niagara perspective on this, on this question, um, the uh, adhesive is uh, definitely recyclable. And especially if we, um, we managed to, to glue, for example, the tabletop with the, with the top layer, the veneer. If that veneer is also polyester, then all the adhesive will go with the veneer if you decouple the two layers. Because the, the adhesive likes the, the polyester side better than the eco side, um, because it's a polyester itself. And then you have two uh, separate streams, and um, on the veneer is already the polyester, and then you recycle that as a polyester. Um, and that is that is really how uh, how we are going to recycle the the, the adhesive itself um, because it's it's more about volume and getting the adhesive on one side of the um, of the materials than it is about the recyclability of the material because that is definitely there. Exactly, couldn't agree more. All right, um, thanks for your answer on that. Uh, we have another question coming in from Ben Crooks. Um, and I think you know him. He says, I, I admit a, a conflict of interest having worked at the same institution with or met all three speakers. Notwithstanding this, can Niaga be phoned so it acts as the honeycomb between the panels? That's one for you, Lucas. Um, on the foaming of the material itself, the adhesive, um, that is not something that we have uh, developed yet. Um, I think that the question should be, and I, I really like this question in terms of can you make um, like thicker panels that are not that heavy? So is it, can we use the adhesive in a way to make, for example, doors that have um, a lot of air inside um, and thereby also isolation? And there I think um, together with Ecor we are working on a solution. If we can foam polyester, then uh, our adhesive should be uh, a, a beautiful material to um, um, to use the or to laminate the foam polyester together with uh, another layer of, uh, for example, ecor. Um, but foaming the adhesive itself is not something that we have uh, developed yet. Maybe Eric, you can um, reply to this. Yeah, well, I, I think for us the current uh, answer lies in what I showed before. Uh, so. Uh, we now have to use a paper honeycomb in between, which is cellulose fibers. 
the ecor is made uh, from uh, cellulose fibers when we can laminate um, with the niaga adhesive the, the strong panel and the paper honeycomb in between we can grow and vary into uh, um, very, a lot of uh, uh, thicknesses but it provides challenges as well so it would be a, it would be an interesting this real interesting idea when we could replace this with uh, the niaga adhesive as well so um, I want to jump into that. Um, I think we've we've discussed a lot about the the glue um, and and what it can do now for products. But I'm actually quite interested in all your perspectives of what this new uh, material uh, can mean uh, in the future of of products uh, with regards also with the complex manufacturing that you mentioned. Uh, maybe Mark, do you want to start off? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I think one of the first things I think this this, this product does is it kind of it, it shows the, the future to me and I think to the whole of civilization, which is that we have to radically change our attitude towards making things if we're not going to end up living on our planet, which is just full of waste and that is environmentally degraded. And it, it so and, and many people kind of, uh, you know, kind of shrug their shoulders and say it's impossible to make things that you know fully recyclable and, and make into other things and i think it's great to see such a proof of principle a number one and b i think that um you know it's, it's good to see these materials because they're kind of nice juxtaposition one is a natural you know organic material you know cellulose fibers it is such a brilliant material and grows and you can grow it anywhere and the other is polyester which is an advanced plastic and, and i and i i I don't buy that the future is either kind of fully grown materials that are only in, in, the, in the natural cycle, so, you know, so-called, or, or that it's purely synthetic. I think that we are going to have to learn how to get the best out of both types of material, and this is a good, good example of that. So, yeah, and I'd like, to, I'd like to add something, King. It also, it also is about the designers. It is also how you design the product using these new technologies coming to market. You have to design it for disassembly. And so take into consideration, uh, as what we've all, uh, we're all involved in, take into consideration when you're designing this product, what is going to happen at the, first, at the end of the first user cycle. So the ease of disassembly, glue like a screw, that's where the, uh, uh, the topic came from, that is really important because when we only try to mimic what is already there, then we don't stimulate creativity and to think outside of the exact existing frameworks. And I think the real challenge is to find people who want to work with us, who come up with designs, which also do credits to the combination of these technologies. Yeah, so come up with stuff. What can you think of? Because um, I think that's the help and the creativity and the co-creation we need to initiate and catalyze. And I agree think, here. Yeah, Lucas wants to mention. Yeah. And um, the, the, the opportunities are endless here. Um, if we work with, with materials like the ECOR material, with, with glass, for example, with polyester, the, all the materials that we know that they can, they can be recycled without uh, losing quality, then, then, then really the, the, the opportunities are endless. But we have to redesign, uh, we have to redesign uh, the stuff around us. So uh, a lot of a lot of exciting work to do there and, uh, and everyone with great ideas and uh, suggestions um, or other ways to help uh, welcome definitely join i thought you were gonna mention we have to redesign everything lucas <laughs> just to, to restate our our main theme um but it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned that um design part of it because that means not only from a material science perspective but there are different perspectives needed a designer um uh, probably also an economist. How do you think that collaboration need to take uh, take shape in in that that with that future materials perspective that you are um, uh, talking about right now? And the uh, if I may, in the business model and the route to market we uh, we chose as Ecor is that we develop a community of designers and a community of craftsmen. Designers it can be product designers, architects, uh, technical designers. Craftsman is a traditional carpenter, which simply puts his, uh, a hinge in it and says it works or it doesn't work. You also need the right experts and partners 
to get to these combinations of technology. And at the end, I think technologies like ours, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's DSM or Niaga or ECO, we are enablers for others to achieve their circular economy ambitions, uh, to achieve their circularity. So the technologies um, are in the enabling part. I think we had the phase of people know and want to change things. It now is at the point where we have to start doing. And that's where we need to have this co-creation, this cooperation, but most importantly, also taking shared responsibility of the combinations of these materials and how we keep them in their integrity so that we can actually have them in a reverse supply chain or on a recycle or upcycle perspective. So I, I don't really want to throw in a new term because I know that we're we're kind of running out of time. But what you mentioned also links quite a lot with with the open source movement. Do you think we also need to be more transparent about the materials that we use uh, and and in our communication? If I if I may, yes, I I, I really agree with that. Um, it's. Um it's for everyone it's for the user also in terms of health but definitely for the ones that are recycling it that they know what what actually is in the product and what is in their our stuff so they can harvest all these different materials and because we don't know and we cannot separate the materials we we kind of maybe lost our our intuition of making because we have we have so many materials around us and we cannot play with it anymore because it has this uh this static um uh, form of, 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 of the product that it is today uh, but if we can separate it and if we can uh, can assess the value of it uh, because we know what's in there um, I think a lot of creativity will come out from uh, from also from users and not only the professionals uh, to start making making stuff Mark I'm, I'm yeah. Have some yeah I agree I think that um, I think the uh, one of the things that we're talking about here is a culture shift. It's, it, this isn't just going to be driven, in my view, by business, a, a business, um, you know, decision. You know, it's, 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 it's not so much that, I think, as, um, as the whole society needs to decide, okay, the way we did things in the past was exciting, but it's just not sustainable, and that we need to re-educate everyone about what stuff is. I think, you know, people care about what's in their food. They should care about what's in their laptop. <laughs> They should care about what's in their desk, uh, what their desk is made of, what their chair is made of. And how do we do that? Well, that is about um, people understanding and having a language that's common and, uh, and understanding the difference between polyester and polyamide. And, and, and I, I think that, we, you know, at the moment, people just find the whole thing too complex. It's full of thousands, hundreds of thousands of materials, and, and they just sort of ignore it all. It's just different colored blobs of stuff. And I think we need to really row back from that. Um, and I, the way to do that is, is for people to be encouraged to make more and to be part of this design, co-design process. Thanks a lot for that answer. And um, we have one more question coming in and I actually want to wrap it up because it is kind of a question that wraps things up. Uh, when will we be able to test Niaga to to take the next step in our ambition to create 100% recycled furniture designs. Question coming from Pim, and I think we should go to Lucas. 100% um, recyclable furniture designs. I think the time to start um, testing this is really tomorrow. Uh, here it's already night, so I prefer tomorrow than today, but. Um, there's no reason to to wait really because we no. have this technology um, we are collaborating with uh, with with, with Ecor here we can combine textiles with fibers with 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 hardware material with flexible material um, so the, the the opportunities are endless again and we can really de redesign everything and, and and furniture is typical this the bulky stuff that ends up at waste um, so um, no need to wait and um, uh, and we are ready for collaboration there. Completely agree. All right, thanks a lot, guys. I want to wrap it up with this. Um, thanks a lot for your talk. Um,
I think it was really inspiring and also to hear a case study because um, what we see now is that um, we, we often don't have a good example of how things work and to, to get inspiration from. Uh, and I think you guys are really a good example on how we can redesign everything. So thanks a lot for that. And um, for everybody watching online, thanks a lot for being with us. The Disruptive Innovation Festival is almost over. But uh, no worries, we record everything and we have Diff on Demand. So if you have missed out on any of the sessions, you can watch it back on the website thinkdiff.co. And if you have any questions, uh, comments, you can still post them. Uh, we ask our speakers if they can uh, have a look later on uh, for any questions and reply to them. So that's it for now. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark, uh, Lucas and Eric for being with us today. And um, yeah, see you at another session.